everybody, Last Outrider here with the final part of the Assault on Armageddon and the Rise of Grasgall. We're now going to talk about Commissar Yarrick. Let's get right into it, my little good gops. Being somewhat soft, it is extraordinary for Umis to gain respect from orcs, especially greenskins led by a soic psychotic, battle-hungry goth like Glasgow. Although space marines are regarded with esteem for their skills in battle, and are none more so than the infamous or famous Commander Dante of the Blood Angels, for all you Blood Angels fans, it was an imperial commissar that drew the most admiration from the orcs. Here was an uncompromising motherfucker, as e eager to shoot his own lads in the head as he was the foe. If that's what it took to gain victory, that's what needed to be done. Commissar Yarrick was certainly a thorn straight up into the ass of Glasgow. For the Greenskins reckon that it was he alone that willed the defenders of Hades' hive to hold on for so long. The orcs gradually learned from their captives that the defenders of Hades had grown to fear Yarrick as much as they dreaded the fury of Grasgull himself. To the orcs, this was the kind of leader they could respect. The fact that he wore goth colors, black with red trim, boosted his esteem even further. It is said that of all of Glasgow's foes, Yarrick was the only one that he ever cursed out. That is high praise indeed. Those works that came face to face with Yarrick uh, were faced with some overwhelming disappointment. In person, Yarrick was only human-sized, although this was lessened somewhat because he did at least wear an orc power claw and bear an evil eye. Amongst the boys, it was said that those orcs that recognized who they were up against were always killed for they stood in gape-jawed disbelief at Yarrick's insulting puniness and so left themselves open for death blow. One orc tribe, however, uh, the more, let me guess, I would think, uh, the blood claws, oh, blood axes, <laughs> acknowledged the value of this tactic even if it was a sly and sneaky kind of trick. The real battle begins. When Armageddon's season of shadows set in, the cyclical time when the planet's volcanic mountains erupted, the turbulent skies were permanently crimson-hued. To the orcs, this was another sign of their impending victory. To get to Armageddon Secundus, the orcs had to cross a vast swath of equatorial jungle considered impenetrable by humans. The fetid swamp region was a morass of mud pits that could submerge armies at a time, and it was filled with ferocious wild beasts. The greenskins, of course, fucking reveled in it. They loved that shit. Attacking flora and fauna while the mechs erected pontoon bridges or projected force fields across the stinking bogs. By their drive and cobbled ingenuity, the orcs' hordes pressed through faster than imperial armies could march. Infantry and armored columns, stampa boys and towering gargants crossed huge bridges and emerged on the far side of the jungles. Once again, the orcs caught the humans unprepared and smashed through their defensive positions. 
As the orcs raced across the ash deserts toward the hive cities, the towering god machines and tank companies of mankind advanced out into the barrens to meet them. From that point on, the battles were more fiercely fought, and orc casualties began to mount. First was the clash on the parched desert known as the Death Barrens. While the colossal war engines of the Iron Skull's Titan legions dueled with the Gargants, the massed enemy tanks began to blow great holes in the orc hordes. The Greenskins did not waver, though, but continued to advance, albeit slightly more slowly, into that thunderous barrage. The energies of the Wag might have been drained then and there, were it not for the dread mobs. Clanking forward, these iron-plated tank killers strode through the cell storm. A land armada of death dreads, killer cans, and honking mork knots lurched into the enemy armor formations. Explosions lit up the plains as power claws wrenched off turrets, buzzsaw arms reached into the savage and exposed crew, and the screams of the inviscerated victims were like music to the orc's ears. With the foe's tanks reduced to smoking wreckage, the stampas and death dreads used their firepower to tip the scales on the evenly matched duel between gargants and titans. Towering mushroom clouds rose from the destroyed imperial titans, and the concussive blasts of their detonation slew many orcs. But when the shockwave ceased, the green tide flowed over the enormous... Traitors. <laughs> the bloodiest of sieges. The sieges that followed brought the Armageddon War to a new state of savagery. By now, the humans knew that they lay, what lay in store for them, and their resistance stiffened. The orcs sacked in furnace hive after blood axes struck a deal with the corrupt governor there. Nice, nice. But you really wonder what the hell that they made, how that conversation would have gone down. Mm, never mind. <clears throat> but they could not break through the great hive cities of Hades or Hell's Reach. In desperation, the Imperial side launched virus bombs, wicked and prescribed technology from their distant past. Hundreds of thousands of orcs died, but still they pressed on, battering themselves against the hive cities with little gain. With his sub-commanders flummoxed, yes, they wrote that word, flummoxed, on how to break through, Grasgol was forced to direct the assaults himself. Grasgol tried many ploys, Lightning assaults, fence, overwhelming wave attacks, and massed bombardments. Air-dropped storm boys attacked from the skies, while the sewer tunnels were infiltrated with the craftiest of commandos. At Hell's Reach, these stratagems paid off, each offensive advancing more deeply into that seaport hive. With the streets red with blood, Grasgol's final tactic to gather the weird boys together, baby, so that their wog-idled minds blasted forth a psychic storm worked perfectly. Paralyzed by madness, the defenders were completely overrun. In Hades, each of Glasgow's moves was parried. The storm boys were ripped from the skies by anti-aircraft fire. The commandos were met by tunnel fighters in a running battle that stymied the underground advance. Siege engines were sabotaged and suicide teams took down the gargants. The defense of Hades Hive was masterminded by Commissar Yarek, who was destined to become the most respected Umi 
that one Glasgow ever met. Sorry, Dante. <clears throat> the unexpected counter-strike. As Glasgow fixated on tearing Hades' hive apart, on his command, another orc army was set to overwhelm the hive city of Archeon. But that was before the sky exploded. Orbital bombardment blasted craters amongst the orc hordes. Even as they gapped skyward, they saw thunderhawks peel out of the cloud cover. The roar of their engines audible over the concussive shockwave of their bombarding runs. The Space Marines, Astartes, the finest warriors in the Imperial service, had arrived. The Blood Angels, the Ultramarines, the Salamanders, all attacked, and the Orcs tasted the bitterness of crushing defeat for the first time. At that moment, if Glasgow had turned his attention to the deteriorating situation, it is likely, and pay attention to this, Space Marine players, it is likely he could have rallied his armies and driven off the Space Marine counterattack. Had he done so, Armageddon would probably have fallen. However, the completion of the Siege of Hades' Hive had become an obsession. The prophet though he was, in the red haze of battle, Grasgull no longer heard any calling, save to grind his iron boots upon those who dared defy him. Finally, Grasgull's own bully boys broke down the last blast door. With the inner gates now open, Glasgow threw everything at the Hive City, unleashing his final rampage. The Space Marines arrived too late to save Hades' Hive. And those inside were massacred to the man. Probably woman and child too. I don't think they discriminate, but that's just me. With his numbers depleted and widely scattered, Grasgull commanded the last of his reinforcements to besiege Tartarus Hive. The fate of the planet hung in the balance, but the Space Marines were quick to redeploy. A drop pod assault struck the orcs even as Gorknots and Stompas smashed down the Hive's gates. Blindsided again, the Greenskids were pushed back and on the verge of breaking when Grasgull arrived. His counterattack was just beginning to wrest the initiative back from the Astartes when Glasgow and his bodyguard disappeared altogether. Boom. Rumors that their illustrious war boss had fallen spread like wildfire amongst the orcs, and they wavered and then broke. With this, the Imperium thought they had driven the orcs from Armageddon. But it was not so. Many fought their way into the ash wastes and escaped, eventually reaching the depths of the equatorial jungles. Moreover, Glasgow was not slain. You know, maybe maybe they're going to write a book like that about it, the same way as they did with um <laughs> with Vulcan. Glasgow lives. <clears throat> Some say the hand of Gork itself reached down to extricate his chosen one. Glasgow's few orc detractors, very few orc detractors, claimed he had fled. But however it happened, the war boss escaped off planet. Boom! And there you go. Next, we're going to go into the mobs of the data slate. But that was it. Assault on high fleet of whatever, Armageddon. Assault on Armageddon, the various hives, the Space Hulk, World Crusher, and the rise of Glasgow from a mere goth to the warlord he became. See you next time, babies. Bye.